So we're going to continue on programming the firmware for one of these little brain boards, which I had made by GLC PCB. Last time we just started out with a firmware, getting familiar with STM32 Cube IDE and programming them in general. We looked at the RGB LED, how we can do that with timers and PWM. We looked at how to do the BMI 08, SPI in polling mode. And we also looked at how to do the USB port and the connection via, for example, a virtual COM port. We're going to do a slightly more advanced topic this time, and that's DMA. And we can use DMA to offload the main MCU and kind of acquire and transmit data in the background without using too much of the CPU cycles. We're also going to be looking at how to then, after DMA, incorporate that with FreeRTOS, so that's a real-time operating system. So hopefully a bit more advanced than last time, and we'll explore the peripherals, and then in future videos we can use that to, for example, implement Kalman filters or just look at some digital filters in general. So without further ado, let's get started. So I just want to quickly show you how you can order these boards for yourself via GLC PCB. So maybe if you want to play along at home and just program it with me, you can do that. So first thing you have to do is navigate to github.com slash pms67 and find this repository, Little Brain Sensor Board. And I've put all the data for these videos in there, so all the firmware, all the libraries from KiCad, but also these Gerben assembly folders. So you can either just download the zip file, or you can clone this repository using just git. Once you have that, let's move it to JLC PCB. Uh, they also have this Wanna CU 2020 online exhibition, which starts on November 10th, and you can win different prizes and get coupons and stuff like that. So just sign up for that if you want. From November 10th. Four layer boards uh, from certain dimensions have gone down to two dollars for four layer PCB, so that's pretty, pretty amazing. Okay, but let's get on with ordering these little brain boards. So just click on quote now, and then we want to upload our Gerber files. And I've made in the directory, then this RAR file here and that contains all the Gerbers. We'll upload this, and this little JLC PCB will process these files and extract things like the layer count and dimensions. So here we go. It's uploaded four layers in these dimensions. You can choose your PCB quantity, but let's just stick with five for now. Then we want impedance control. I typically go with hot air service leveling or ENIG. And we want to remove the order number by clicking on specify location. Of course, we want SMT assembly. We want the top side assembled, five pieces, and I've added the tooling holes already. So click on added by customer. Click confirm. Now we need to upload the assembly information. There's a bill of materials file. We can find that in the Git repo under assembly, bill of materials, and of course the footprint position files. Then we click on next. Now I've really done this for you, but you can verify the left and right columns just to see that the parts match. Now you see some of the parts are out of stock at the moment, but I'm sure soon they'll be back in stock and you can order these boards. Okay, but all, once you've checked that, just click on next. Now there's parts placement and rotations, and I've already done that for you, so the correct rotations. Um, okay. Yeah, and that's all you pretty much have to do. Then you just save to cart and choose your shipping method, and you can get these boards delivered to you. And it's about $88, plus, of course, the parts that aren't in stock. So let's say about $100, I guess, maybe a bit more, for these boards, and that's five of them. That's pretty good. All right, but let's get moving on to the firmware. So here we are again in STM32 Cube IDE. And I'm going to assume you watched the previous video where we set up all the other peripherals, for example, the RGB LED, we set up the serial wire debug pins, USB in the virtual COM port, we set the external crystal oscillator, and we also set up SPI1, which is connected to the inertial measurement unit, and we set that up in polling mode. We're going to add a few bits to this before we move on to code, but first of all, let me just show you the data sheet for the BMI-088, which is the inertial measurement unit. And this is the block diagram for it, and you can kind of see it's split into two parts. One is the accelerometer, which has its own like ADCs and SPI interface and so on. And one is the gyroscope, which is very similar. But what we're interested in are actually these interrupt pins. So int one and int two and int three and int four. Now, every time new data is available for the accelerometer or for the gyroscope, we can actually set up these interrupt pins to go high or low. And this is really useful because we can use these interrupts connected to our STM32 microcontroller to trigger DMA reads and writes. And that's what we're gonna be doing. So going back to STM32 Cube IDE, I've actually set up the interrupt pins or connected them to the MCU on PC2 and PC3. So if we click on PC2, you can see down here we have the option of GPIO underscore XI2, and that's an external interrupt. So we're actually using this essentially to trigger an interrupt and we read that from the BMI 088. So remember, right click, we can enter user label, and let's just call that int ACK. So this is the interrupt for the accelerometer, and PC3, same thing again, left click and GPIO XI3, external interrupt. That is the interrupt for the gyroscope. 
Okay, so we've added these two interrupt pins, and that we'll be using those interrupts then to trigger the DMA transfers. Now, what we need to do to enable the DMA streams for SPI1 is go down here into connectivity, click on SPI1, and you can see there's several different tabs here, and one of them is uh, the DMA settings tab. So click on that, and now we need to add the transmit and receive DMA streams. So it's really simple, click on add. Then we want the type, for example, let's start with receive. Now it automatically chooses which is the correct DMA number and which is the correct DMA stream. So you don't have to worry anything about that. The direction is peripheral to memory and we want the priority. It doesn't really matter in this case, but let's just set it to high. Okay, data width, that's important. We want them to be bytes. So we're gonna be using byte transfers, so that's fine. And another important thing is the mode. So we either have normal or circular mode. Normal is you have to, every time you wanna read or you wanna write, you have to start the DMA transfer or request yourself. Circular means it's kind of just in, repeats indefinitely. So once it's done transferring, once it's done receiving, it'll just repeat by itself. In this case, because we are triggering via an external interrupt, we want normal. So the DMA reads and writes are gonna be triggered by these interrupts. Okay, so we do the same thing for the transmit stream. So SP1TX, it chooses all the correct streams for us. There's direction memory to peripheral. And let's just change that to high as well, the priority. The data width is still byte and the mode is still normal. Awesome, so that all looks all right. Now up here in the interrupt controller tab, we also need to enable the interrupts for the accelerometer and gyroscope pins. And all you have to do is click on these two checkboxes here to enable line two and line three. And that's pretty much it regarding the interrupts. All the DMA interrupts are already set automatically for you. Now we click on save and it will generate code. So click on yes, and it'll generate all the code for us, including all the lower level drivers for the DMA, and it'll route the stuff together. Now you'll see here, some of this stuff really you saw in the previous video, right? We had the USB virtual COM port include, the, uh, the polling driver for the BMI-088, which is the inertial measurement unit. But you see here, it's added these two uh, DMA handles, uh, both for SPI-1, RX and TX, and that's what we, what we set in this file over here. And all our old stuff is still in here. So all the LED RGB code is still there. And this is all from last time. If you need a refresher, uh, feel free to go back to my initial programming tutorial video and everything is explained in detail there. But yeah, basically here we have just turned the LED off, initialize the LED and initialize the BMI 088. And now we're gonna add the code to actually not do polling with SPI, but actually do DMA. So let's get started with that. Okay, so first of all, I've moved all of the drive code we had from last time into their own little header and .c files. So bmi 088 and .c. And this is just so everything's nicely contained. Effectively, all I've done is taken the data from the data sheet, for example, all the register addresses and defines, and put them into a neat little file. This includes the initialization function. This includes functions just to read a single register or write to a, to a register, as well as, for example, the polling functions we looked at last time. And today we're actually going to look at how to fill in the blanks essentially for these DMA functions. So the way this is going to work is that we actually have two functions relating to the read process and two DMA functions. So we have read accelerometer with a DMA, and we also have a function that handles everything once that read has been completed. The way DMA works is effectively we start the read, we let it do it in the background, and at some point we'll get an interrupt from the DMA, uh, DMA handler telling us, okay, this transaction has finished. So first we have to start the DMA transaction, at some point we'll get an interrupt, and once we've got the interrupt, once the read has been completed, we'll end essentially the transaction here. All right, so let's start off with this read accelerometer DMA function. Now this function returns an unsigned int, so either one if it's succeeded, or zero if the transaction didn't succeed, and it takes this argument here, which is a pointer to a struct a custom struct I made essentially contains all the IMU data. So if I look at that in the header file, it contains all the SPI handle, so SPI1 in our case, it contains the locations of the chip select pins for the accelerometer and gyroscope, some conversion constants, and the actual measured accelerometer and gyroscope values. So that's what we're passing then to this function. Now remember we're using full duplex SPI, which means we have to transmit and receive essentially at the same time, so we need a transmit and a receive buffer. Now remember the, from the data sheet, from the uh, accelerometer data sheet, to, we want to read these values. So from OX12 to OX17, that's six bytes in total. 
and it's structured as a most significant bit and a least significant bit. And that forms the XYZ components of the accelerometer data. And the way we do that, if we think back to last video, is we need to send the register address and we need to flip the most significant bit to a one. So let's create our transmit buffer and it's gonna be eight bytes. Eight bytes because one, the first byte is the register address ORed with OX80, so flip the most significant bit. Then it's one byte of dummy data and then six extra bytes because that's what, what we want to read. Okay, so then we change the first byte to the accelerometer uh, data register and we want to all that with OX80 because we want to flip the most significant bit to a one. So OX80 in binary is a one followed by seven zeros. Now the rest of the TX buffer doesn't matter what that contains. As soon as the accelerometer reads this and says, ah, it's only a read, it doesn't care about uh, what data it receives. We just have to send data because we're doing full duplex. And then to start the uh, SPI transaction, we need to pull the chip select pin low. Now remember in the struct over here, I declared it in the IMU struct. So we just need to access essentially this pin bank and this pin. And then the how function is actually GPIO pin reset. That pulls this GPIO low. And with that, we started the SPI transaction pretty much. And now we actually want to start the DMA stream to transmit and receive the data kind of in the background. And the how function is how SPI transmit receive. So this is for duplex uh, underscore DMA. Okay. First thing we need to pass is the SPI handle. Then we need to pass the transmit buffer. And now we actually need to put in a receive buffer. Now I could just create a function, uh, a variable in here, like Rx buff with eight bytes. But then of course, this is running in the background. So this transmit receive DMA will finish sometime in the background. So we can't actually put it in this function. We need to make it more global. So I'm going to put that in a struct. Essentially a uint 8t buffer, so unsaid int buffer. And let's just call that x accelerometer rx buff, right? And that's going to be eight bytes. All right, and now we can access that and pass that to this function. So it's going to be imu rx buff. And we want to transmit and receive eight bytes. All right, and that's pretty much all there is to the hell um, DMA function. So we pass the handle, we say we want to transmit these bytes and we want to put the result in these bytes and this byte buffer. And this is the number of bytes we want to transmit. Now I said before that we are actually returning either one or zero if this succeeded or not. And the way we do that is, so if we check if this function returns hell okay, then we say, okay, that everything's good. Let's just return a one. Otherwise, the transaction didn't succeed and we should pull the chip select pin low again before continuing, right? Because it, it didn't work out. So, well, we pull it high rather. And then we turn a zero to indicate, yes, uh, well, this didn't, didn't succeed. But that's pretty much all there is. So it's just a quirk of the chip itself that we need to um, send a dummy byte and that we need to or the register address with a one, more significant byte one to indicate a read. Then we pull the, the chip select line low. Then we try and start the transaction. If everything's okay, return a one. If everything isn't okay, we pull the chip select line high again and we return zero. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Now we're gonna worry about when we actually trigger this read accelerometer DMA function in just a bit, but let's just implement this function down here, which is actually when, okay, we've received an interrupt from the DMA stream, which we'll look at in just a second. What do we do afterwards? The first thing we have to do is actually pull the GPIO line or the chip select line high again, because we're done with the transaction, right? Assuming everything worked out. Once we're done with that, we actually need to convert all these raw values according to the data sheet. So now we will have received six actual data bytes. So we need to put them together. And the way we do that, right, we wanna form 16 bit integers. So we receive the most significant bit, we shift it left by eight places, and we all that with the least significant bit, and then just cast it to a signed 16 bit integer. And we do that for the remaining X, Y, and Z components as well. And then finally, there is also a conversion from these raw values to actual units. So in the accelerometer case, I would like this to be in meters per second squared. In the gyroscope, I might want it to be in radians per second. So there's gonna be some sort of conversion factor. And I'm actually storing the conversion factor in the struct as well. And I'm calculating this conversion factor in the initialization function, which I called right at the beginning. And this is all stuff you can get from the data sheet. But effectively, all I need to do now is convert to meters per second squared. And I'm storing that in the struct as well. So I'm doing the acceleration, accelerometer conversion, constant times our raw value. So really simple. 
Okay, so let's see actually how we trigger these functions and when they need to be triggered. So now that we've added the DMA and accelerometer part to our BMI08 driver, let's go back to main.c and see where, how we can actually start these DMA transactions. And the way we're going to do that is actually via the GPIO interrupt pin we set at the beginning of this video. Remember PC2 was our accelerometer interrupt, which is connected to the inertial measurement unit. And this will always go high when there's new data ready from the accelerometer. So essentially we want to see, is there an interrupt on PC2? If there is, let's start the DMA transfer and read out some data from the accelerometer. So back in main.c, you see I included our BMI088.h header file, which contains our driver. And I've also uh, created a struct, which will then be passing to these various functions. And we want to now write the callback function for the GPIO interrupt. And luckily, HAL provides that for us. So it's actually called HAL GPIO external interrupt underscore callback. And as an argument, it actually takes which GPIO pin caused the interrupt or which, on which GPIO pin there was an interrupt. Okay, so because we named our GPIO pins quite nicely, so int underscore x, we can actually type that in here. So we want to check if the GPIO pin that registered the interrupt is equal to the accelerometer pin interrupt, we want to start our DMA read. So now we need to copy this read accelerometer data function over to our, our interrupt handler. And then of course you want to pass our struct by reference. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So every time there's an interrupt, we check which pin it was on, and then we call the function we just wrote to start the DMA transfer. So now that we've started the transfer, effectively all we have to do is wait, and then we will get an interrupt from the DMA saying, your data has been read out. And then we need to process that data. So now we need to implement the second callback. The first callback was just the interrupt from the GPIO pin telling us, okay, let's start and read the data. The second interrupt will be a DMA, essentially callback, DMA SPI callback, which will tell us that the transfer has been completed. And in HAL, that is simply void, now SPI, TXIX, because it's full duplex, complete callback. And there's an argument, it's the, the handle, the SPI handle that actually is complete. So the first thing I typically do is check, is this even the correct SPI handle that called it? Because I also have SPI1, I've got SPI3 on this. I just want to make sure, yeah, this, is, this was actually the SPI handle that is sitting with the inertial management unit. So I just say, okay, is that equal to SPI1? Then all we have to do is copy our second function, which is our complete function, and pop that in here. And again, we want to pass, pass our struct by reference. And that's all there is to it. So, right, we once we get an interrupt on one of the GPIO pins, the accelerometer interrupt, we start the transaction. Once the transaction is complete, the DMA transaction, essentially the microcontroller will call this. We check if the instance is correct, and then we do the cleanup work, which we wrote in this function down here, where we just convert all the raw values to meters per second squared in this case. Now that's pretty much all there is. The next step would then be to write the similar functions, also DMA and interrupt for the gyroscope. And then you're pretty much done with a DMA driver for this inertial measurement unit. Now let's actually test this on the real world board. Now because we're using DMA and interrupts and all of that, the while loop actually becomes a lot simpler and I only have kind of accessory tasks I'm doing here. One of them is transmitting the accelerometer and gyroscope data via USB. And that's, you can see that in the previous video on how to do that. Then I'm also just toggling the red LED, and then I'm always waiting 250 milliseconds before I do it again. But all the DMA and interrupt, interrupt stuff is, ha is happening in the background. So we're not loading the MCU only by these functions over here, which is really nice. So let's switch the camera and see if it's doing it. So now I've got the whole system up and running. I've got my ST-Link uh, connected via a serial wire debug cable to the little brain board, and I'm powering it via USB and also relaying data via USB. You can see I've really flashed the firmware, the red LED is blinking away. And I look here, it's enumerated as a virtual comp port, comp3. I've got HTEM open, and that's showing me the accelerometer and gyroscope data from the IMU, which has been connected, collected via DMA. So if I rotate the board, the accelerometer values changes, the gyroscope value changes, and this is essentially all done by DMA. So the MCU is being offloaded. You can see I'm rotating the board here, and that's giving me different changes here. So now that we've looked at a brief introduction to DMA on STM32 microcontrollers, I just briefly also like to give you an overview of FreeRTOS, so a real-time operating system that can run on these STM32 microcontrollers and do task scheduling for you. So you don't have to write your own timer functions. You can essentially just schedule several different tasks and then let them run and let the scheduler decide 
which priority tasks run when, but at fixed times. Okay, so the way we do that is go back to STM32 cube IDE on this configuration file. And FreeRTOS is actually included. If you go under middleware, click on FreeRTOS, and then choose your interface. I typically go with CMSYS version one. Okay, there's a lot of, lot of things you can set up with FreeRTOS, including all of these kernel settings over here, what tick rates you're having, what if you're using floating point units and so on. So I'm only gonna go over the, the really, really basics now, just so we can see how we can get a really simple FreeRTOS system running and let our drivers run in that system. So typically I will enable the floating point unit because it's an STM32 F405. So I want the floating point unit enabled to uh, take care of that. We want preemption enabled. Uh, preemption is pretty much so we can have different tasks running at different sampling rates and they will have different priorities. So if one low priority task takes too long, uh, we can let the scheduler say, okay, let a higher priority task that is due take over now. And that's using this preemption. That's pretty much, there's stuff like mutexes and semaphores and stuff like that. But essentially now we're just gonna only look at tasks and how we can schedule them. So I click on the task tab over here and you can see there's this default task over here. And every task has a name, it has a priority, it has a stack size, so effectively how much memory it can use and what its entry function is called and how its memory is allocated and stuff like that. Now you can, if you double click on it, you can change it. Uh, so let's let's create different tasks. So we might need a task for the LED to flash, and you might need want a task for the USB, and so on. All right. Okay. So let's just start one. Let's call this uh, LED task. We can change the priority to let's say it's a really low priority stack size 128. Let's just leave that, and let's call the entry function start LED task. All of that is fine. Click OK. So we've got one task to flash the LED. We might want another task to, for example, do the USB transfer. Okay, so let's call that a USB task. And this priority might be slightly higher, maybe normal, than the LED task. So we draw, I'd prefer, if both run at the same time, the LED task and the USB task, I'd prefer the USB task to run, is essentially what I'm saying with this priority. A stack, we'll probably need a larger stack because we're, uh, we're using a lot of buffers in the USB task. So I don't know, uh, 256 should be fine. And of course, give it a name, start USB task, and everything else is fine. And for now, these two tasks are pretty much all we need, because the DMA is going to be running in the background anyway, and we won't really need a task for that. Okay, and that's pretty much it. Now you all have to do is click save, and all the code will be generated. Before the code is generated, Artos will tell you you'll, you might want to switch your time source. So let's click on no. Go back here and then go to system core, sys, and then change this time course to timer one. Now click save again, and um, the system shouldn't complain. All right, so now all the code has been generated. As you can see, we still have our original code, so we've still got the driver includes and the USB includes and so on, and all the callbacks and so forth, the LED initialization functions. But something new has appeared over here in the, in the main function. So we have all these definitions here for mutexes, semaphores, timers, and so on. But what's interesting for us right now uh, are these threads and tasks over here, and then OS kernel start. So secondly, we, this is here to start the scheduler. So this will actually start saying, okay, when do I run which task? And it'll handle all that for us. But before that, we need to create the tasks. And luckily, FreeRTOS through kubeid has done all that for us. So we create the first task, which is the LED, and we create the second task, which is the USB task. So I have, I've had to done, do nothing, which is really good. Now you can really see in the comments left by the FreeRTOS uh, pre-made code that actually we will never arrive at the while loop. As soon as the OS kernel start is called, the scheduler takes over and, and then calls tasks at specific intervals, depending on what we write in the code. So now we're not gonna put anything in the while loop anymore, but rather go to the threads and functions that are defined, for example, by start LED task, and start USB task. Both of these functions are fairly low down here. So let's have a look, there we go. All right, so we've got one function for start LED task, and that's gonna be called by the scheduler, and one start USB task, also gonna be called by the scheduler. The part before the for loop in each of these tasks is only gonna be called once when the MCU starts or when the task is first called. But everything inside this for loop will be called depending on what value you set in the OS delay and that's in milliseconds. So if I write OS delay 1000, 
everything that's in this for loop in this task will be called once every second or once every 1000 milliseconds. Okay, so that everything before that only get called once, everything in the for loop called essentially depending on the OS delay. Now, if two tasks happen to want to run together at the same time, the scheduler will say, okay, the one with the higher priority will run first. And that's really cool with this RTOS. We don't have to do any of this management ourselves. All we have to do is write some initialization function and then whatever we want in these for loops. Okay, so the LED task, essentially we just want to store, for example, the intensity of the LED. So let's call it LED intensity and we start that at zero. Then we might want to toggle the LED. So we might do LED RGB set intensity, LED intensity. So we only want to toggle the red part. And then we change the intensity from full on to full off. And that's all I'm doing here. All right. So this is only going to be called once to initialize the variable. Then we set the intensity of the red LED with this variable. If the intensity is zero, we change it to 100. If not, we change it to zero. And then we wait essentially one second for it to flash again. So really, really simple. So that's the LED task. Let's move on to the USB task. And remember the USB task was used for us to transmit all the accelerometer and gyroscope data which we, which we processed from the inertial measurement unit by USB and the virtual COM port. So again, we want this to only be called once and we wanna create a little buffer here. So let's make a buffer of size 64. That should be enough to store all our, all our data that we wanna transmit. And then again, we just use this sprintf function and then the CDC transmit function. So if I just paste that in here, and now, of course, we want to set the OS delay. So essentially, at what refresh or sample time do you want to transmit whatever is in this buffer? And let's say we want to do that every half a second, so every 500 milliseconds. And that's pretty much all you do. So the log buffer is created once, and then everything in the for loop is executed, hopefully, every 500 milliseconds. And that pretty much concludes the only two tasks we made. So we're flashing an LED at every one second, and we're sending data via USB every half a second. And because in our main function up here, we started, the, uh, we started the initialization function of the accelerometer and gyroscope. All the DMA stuff and all the interrupts will be, hand, will be handed in the background. So we started the DMA before that, and we set up all the interrupts before that. Or rather, HAL and stm 32 cube ID did that for us. So let's see if this works by uploading the code to the board. So I've connected the little brain board via serial debug and the ST-Link, as well as powering it via USB, as I did before. And we are going to just going to test this by using the debugging functions. So I'm going to set some breakpoints. The one I might be setting over here in the LED function or LED task, and one over here in the USB task. And then I can just click on this little bug icon up here to flash the firmware to the board and then actually start the debugging cycle. So you can see down here, everything's being uploaded, download verified successfully, and we have our first breakpoint, of course, in the main. So I can just click on this little arrow in the top left, click resume, and then Okay, so the USB task triggered first. Click resume again. The LED task triggered, all right? So you can see the red LED is flashing away every one second, and that's the free RTOS um, LED task every once a second. And of course, you have the USB relaying data at double the rate. So every half a second, we're relaying all the accelerometer gyroscope data from the board. So if I'm moving the board, you can see different values change as well. And that's free RTOS and all the DMA stuff doing its thing. So I hope this video was helpful to show you how we can use DMA to offload the MCU and take care of like data acquisition tasks and also how we can use free RTOS really basically to schedule tasks and make sure tasks run at certain and fixed times with different priorities. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, uh, leave a comment if you have any questions or any suggestions for future videos. Otherwise, thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. That really helps me out and I hope to see you in a future video. Thanks again.